All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your attention. Very happy to be here for the second year in a row. I'll be talking about quantifying uncertainty in model predictions using a technique known as conformal prediction. So let's get right, right into it. I think it's mandatory these days to start your talks with reference to LLMs. So uh, as a motivation for why we should quantify uncertainty, here's an example from Google's press release where they were announcing BARD, and I'm sure you've seen it before. But someone had prompted the model by asking for some interesting facts about the James Webb Space Telescope, and BARD dutifully replied with three very neat ideas. Except the person prompting this didn't realize BARD wanted to play two truths and a lie, because one thing here is completely false, just absolutely made up and not true at all. The problem is, this large language model gave no indication of its confidence in the outputs that it was giving. There's no indication whatsoever that one of these things is completely false. And unless you're an expert in astronomy, you probably would have no way of telling which one of these is false. If you're interested, it's last one. It wasn't the James Webb telescope that discovered the first exoplanets or took their picture. It was the very large telescope. And it's not just BARD. ChatGPT does this too. I'm sure there's, there's endless examples of mistakes that they make. Like if you ask it what is the fastest marine mammal, it might answer a peregrine falcon, which I don't think is a marine animal or a mammal, uh, but it is pretty fast. So there's been a lot of PR around this, of course. We don't call these things mistakes or made up answers anymore. They're hallucinations. Uh, and I don't mean to make fun of LLMs. They really are amazing what, what's been happening and the amount of progress that's been made recently. But my issue with them is that they don't indicate how confident they are, they are in their answers. They state everything in a matter of fact way and they don't know how to say, I don't know, I'm not sure. The only indication you get that something might be wrong is these little disclaimers at the bottom of the web page. So this is not at all how humans discuss ideas and answer questions to one another. We very naturally state how confident we are in our answers. We say things like, oh, that's easy, I know what the answer is, or I'm not sure about this, but it might be so-and-so. We also, along with signaling our unconfidence to other people, we, we offer alternatives when we're not sure. We say, you know, I'm not quite sure of the answer, it might be A or B. These kind of uh, ideas of signaling unconfidence and offering alternatives is very much how we go about making decisions in our everyday life thousands of times a day. But I want to ground this talk more in traditional machine learning methods. So let's take an, an example of regression here. Let's say you're doing house price prediction. I'm sure many of you have been on popular websites where you can browse house listings, and maybe you've found this nice Toronto detached with a red door listed at 1.19 million. On the website somewhere it says we use AI to estimate home value, and this house is going to sell for $1,376,595. No. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a house sell with a 595 in the last digits place. So it makes it sound like a deal from Walmart. But uh, anyway, this estimation is probably more useful than the listing price. You know, that doesn't mean much these days. But would you really be confident making an offer to purchase this home for $1.38 million just based on this estimate? What if instead the website had told you there's a 95% chance that the sale price will be between 1.26 and 1.48 million. Personally, I wouldn't be very comfortable offering 1.38 because you know, there's a good chance that I'm gonna be overbid or outbid by uh, up to $100,000 and also a big chance that I might be overbidding myself by 100,000. Compare that to if we had been given the information there's a 95% chance that the sale price will be between 1.34 and 1.39. Then, Offering 1.38 seems pretty reasonable. We're, we're at the top of the range, but we're not likely overpaying by two months. So this is the kind of process that we make and the, the ideas that we will consider when we're trying to make decisions. And this helps us be confident in the decisions that we ultimately make. Uh, but coming back even to a more grounded place, some other reasons why we need to quantify uncertainty with the models we train and put into production is ultimately coming down to the fact that they're trained on limited data sets. A model can give you the same prediction on two different samples, but with very different levels of confidence because of uh, the data it was trained on. So take this decision tree on the left. 
Uh, in a decision tree, we take a sample of data for a training and we propagate it down to the leaf nodes along all the decisions. And once they're in the leaf nodes, we look at the distribution in order to make predictions about new data. So let's say we're trying to predict the likelihood of something being a blue triangle. In the far left leaf node, the distribution there is 50-50. So for a new point, we would predict a 50% chance that it's a blue triangle. But that prediction would come with very low confidence because it's based on only two data points. Uh, that orange circle there could have been an outlier, could have just been a, a random mistake that happened to fall in there. And if we were to sample more points from the training data set, then they might all come out as blue triangles. That would greatly change the prediction we make. It would be closer to 100% for a prediction. And if you contrast that with the, dis the leaf on the right-hand side, where we still have a 50-50 distribution, we would still predict 0.5 for a new data point, but that prediction would come with much higher confidence because it's based on a lot more data. And the same ideas play for regression problems too. Even if I have a data set where the variance is not changing from one region of the data to, the, to another region, we can have much higher or lower confidence in our prediction based on how much training data we've seen. Probably the most important reason to be quantifying uncertainty is because of how models behave when you give them out of distribution data. So let's say I've trained my classifier model on MNIST, predict handwritten digits from zero to nine. If I give the model another example, like shown in the middle of the screen, uh, looking at that, I might expect it to give some likelihood of being a four or maybe a nine. Both of those would be reasonable guesses because this is a digit. It matches the distribution of the training. The next image over, I'm not quite sure what that is. It might be a four, it might be an eight. Uh, the fact that it might not be a digit at all, I would expect that the model has lower confidence, even if it does predict it as a four. And then going all the way to the right, uh, this, if we feed this data point to the model, it'll see, okay, this is a black and white image, 28 by 28 pixels. That's the type of data I was trained on. And it'll come up with essentially some random answer, maybe saying, oh, I think it's a two, and give some confidence. <laughs> the problem is it's not a two, it's a shoe. It's not a digit at all. So ideally, our models should signal that this data doesn't match what I've seen before and refuse to make a prediction on it, or at the very least, make predictions with very low confidence. This is not typically what happens in standard models that uh, train unless you think about these topics. So that's some motivation of why we should care about uncertainty quantity. Let's look at some methods that are used uh, for doing so. So going back to classifiers again, they have a very natural inbuilt notion of uncertainty. It's just the raw output of the model. So a classifier typically will output a number between zero and one for each of the K classes that we're looking at. And so I'll denote the classifier as the function f acting on input data x and giving some output y. A higher raw score output from the model for class K indicates that the model is more confident in some sense about that prediction. Now, this is a heuristic notion of, of confidence or quantifying uncertainty, but the question is whether that score alone is a good notion of uncertainty. This comes back to the idea of calibration. So when we look at a prediction like this and we see a raw score of 0 0.2, we might expect that that means something along the lines of there's a 20% chance that this is the correct class, that, that the correct class is. But of course, uh, for any given input, these data sets are designed such that it's not 80% one thing and 20% another thing, it's 100% something. And so that 20% chance is really referring to a group of images. So maybe a better statement for what we expect is if we consider all outputs with a raw score close to 0 0.2, then the predicted class on those data points will be correct 20% of the time. And so just to drive that home in case you're unfamiliar, I'll make a comparison to histogram. So if I were to create a histogram for the model's outputs, what I would do is take my data set, run it through each point through the model and collect those scores. Then uh, at each score level, I would take the points with predictions close to that score level, like 0 0.2, and I would count how many data points fell into that bin. 
And then on the y-axis, I, I plot that down. So the histogram can have any shape, really. There's no right or wrong answer to what it should be. To look at calibration, we instead use a reliability plotter, simply a calibration plotter. So it's the same idea. We run all the data points for the model, collect them into bins, and we take all predictions with value close to, let's say, 0 0.2. But this time, we compute the fraction of them that ended up being correct. And that's what we plot on the y-axis. So for all the points that had predictions close to 0.2, we expect 20% of those ended up correct. And data points that got a prediction 0.9, 90% of them should end up correct. So when a model is well calibrated, you should see on this type of reliability plot that it just increases linearly at 45 degree angle. So that's what's shown here. Uh, mathematically, what we might say is that the for a given input x, the probability that the true class is equal to the predicted class is simply equal to the model output itself. And so when we have a model output that is well calibrated, that is more meaningful. We can interpret the outputs of the model as probabilities rather than just some raw score. And some machine learning models out of the box do pretty well on this idea of calibration. Decision trees notably are pretty good. However, deep neural networks are notoriously bad. They tend to be extremely overconfident. So at the bottom, I'm showing an example reliability plot for a neural network. The red bars along the diagonal are showing what you would hope to see for a well-calibrated model. But the blue bars are what the models actually are. And they're all low and to the right. So for example, for the bin around uh, prediction scores of 0 0.9, the model's actually only achieving 50% accuracy much lower than you would expect for calibrated. So it's overconfident. It's predicting numbers that are too high based on the accuracy it's actually getting. So this is a pervasive problem in uh, deep, deep neural networks and other forms of machine learning modeling that you need to correct somehow. Uh, it won't be taken care of for you. So the method that I'm going to recommend for quantifying uncertainty and addressing calibration is called conformal prediction. Conformal prediction is a very general purpose method that allows us to take heuristic notions of uncertainty and convert them into rigorous notions. And the main idea of conformal prediction is that instead of giving you a point estimate, a point prediction, it will return a set of predictions. So for the example from the last slide, if uh, we show the model this, well, it's a ship, it'll return, uh, in this case, the model was very confident about its prediction. And so it might return a set that contains a single element. In this case, it happens to be right. But when the model is less confident about its predictions, it will return sets that have more than one option. It could be a couple different types of monkey or lemur. And this really does accord with the way that humans make decisions. It's the size of this prediction set that's quantifying how uncertain the model is. But along with that, when the model is more uncertain, it's giving us options providing alternatives is exactly how we interact with normal. The main, uh, the main power of conformal prediction comes from a statistical guarantee that it provides. It says that the correct answer is in the provided prediction set with probability at least 1 minus alpha. And so alpha, 1 minus alpha can be thought of as the success rate of our prediction. And it's something that we have control over based on our tolerance for error. It's easy to see how uh, you can make fewer mistakes simply by adding more options to the prediction set, right? If I put more possibilities in the prediction sets, I'm more likely to get the right one in there. But uh, we'll also see that larger prediction sets end up being less useful, so there is a trade-off. But conformal prediction provides this statistical rigor while being a very versatile approach that can be used in many different settings is also rather simple to apply. So I'll come back to the idea of prediction sets and talk about what we can do with them once we get them. But let's first go through how we are supposed to construct them. And this follows the conformal recipe. So you can print this out and put this in your cookbook. All we need to begin with are three ingredients. We need a model, and it should be pre-trained. So this is going to be any type of model. I don't care if it's a neural network architecture, decision tree, linear regression. It can be classification. It can be a regression type model. Really anything works. 
but the model has to come with a heuristic notion of uncertainty. But again, this is usually just taken to be the model outputs itself, those raw scores. The only other thing we need is a fresh batch of data that the models never see, and we can get cooking. So I'll go through the directions for the conformal recipe one by one on the next slide. Let's start with this heuristic notion of uncertainty, usually thought of as the model output. We want to convert that into a disagreement score, a function where larger scores will tell us that there's worse agreement between the inputs and the outputs through this. So we'll work through with two examples again, side by side. So classification, we can simply take the model's output on the correct class and convert it slightly. So if we use one minus the model's output on the correct class, you can see that uh, if the model is predicting the correct class with high confidence, then this will be one minus something close to one to zero, and that means there's no disagreement. On the other hand, if, we, if the model is confident about some other class, we'll have one minus something close to zero, which is one, and then we have a measure of uh, high disagreement for that. And it's just as simple for regression. When we do regression, the model gives us a point estimate f of x, and that probably will not be equal to the true value y. And so the distance between our estimate and the true value is a measure of agreement for the model. The really neat thing is that any score whatsoever will work for this task. Conformal prediction will give you the guarantee it promised. Uh, but some disagreement scores are more useful than others. So this is where the art and the research is in this problem, is coming up with disagreement scores that give you more useful outputs at the end. So now that we have defined our score, we can simply run all the data points in our calibration data set through it, and we get a whole set of scores. Let me plot those scores on a histogram to visualize. So in this example that I've made up, uh, the model is doing quite well. For most examples, the uh, disagreement scores are low. That's a good thing. And there's some tale of things that was getting wrong. The next thing we want to do is find the one minus alpha quantile in the So just to make it concrete, let's say I want my success rate, one minus alpha, to 90%. So what I do is find the uh, threshold on my disagreement score where 90% of examples had a lower So In this case, if I'm eyeballing it, it's around you know, 0.18. And just to drive this point home, if I were to take a new data point, what this means is there's a 90% chance that the new data point's disagreement would be less than this threshold. This is going to get used immediately. Now that we've got the threshold Q, that's all we need, and we can move forward to start making prediction tests. And so the recipe instructs us to, when we have a new data point X, we're going to add all possible labels to the prediction set that have disagreement scores less than threshold. So in the classification task, our disagreement score was one minus F. So we compute the one minus F for all the possible classes. And then we impose our threshold Q, and we say any labels, any classes that had a disagreement under this threshold are going to be added to the set. So in this case, the model was very confident about one thing, and so that, only that one thing had a low disagreement score, and only that one thing got added to the prediction set. But if the model was less confident about its uh, prediction, or if the threshold was higher based on the calibration data, then more and more things would get added to the prediction set. And uh, just as easily, we can do the re regression example. So here again, the disagreement score was the absolute difference between uh, our point estimate and the label we're looking at. So let's look at all possible labels, all values of y. And if I plot out that dis disagreement score, I just get the, the absolute value function, right? Classic. Now, what do I do? I impose my quantile threshold. In this case, uh, look like that. And I'm instructed to add everything to the prediction set with a score less than q. That's what it looks like. We end up getting a interval of uh, points, uh, labels, predictions around uh, our point prediction f of x. 
everything from f of x minus q up to f of x plus q gets added to the picture. And so in, in these cases, uh, the model is able to quantify its uncertainty about the point estimate by how large the prediction set is, and at the same time, offer alternatives if it's not confident. Okay, so just to recap, we had four steps. We define a disagreement score using a heuristic notion of uncertainty. We compute disagreements on the calibration set and find the one minus alpha quantile. And then from then on, once we've got that quantile, that's all we need, that threshold Q, we can compute prediction sets by adding everything with disagreement less than that quantile. And the magic is when we follow this recipe, conformal prediction guarantees that the correct answer will be in the prediction set with probability one minus alpha. Uh, and for the experts in the room, there's a caveat in number three. It's not quite the one minus alpha quantile. It's a finite sample correction to that, but uh, simple enough for this. So let me now come back to the question I alluded to earlier, which was how do we use prediction sets? So it's really great that we can achieve these powerful statistical guarantees that give us confident in, confidence in the estimates that our model outputs. But uh, the question remains, at the end of the day, we want to make a decision. Usually when we are deploying models in the real world, they give us point estimates. And the nice thing about that is, that's just a decision we can move forward with. So <laughs> everyone knows that having a set of possible decisions is not the same thing as having a decision. If you go out with friends and you want to uh, have some lunch, and there's three restaurant suggestions out there. We all know that having three options is not the same as having a decision, right? It, really, I'm fine with anything. You pick. No, you pick. Like, someone just make a decision, right? So it, it's clear that we need some further strategy to convert a set of possibilities into a decision. And uh, because prediction sets very naturally align with the way that humans make decisions, it makes a lot of sense to include conformal prediction in pipelines where humans are in the loop. So I'll give two examples of such pipelines. One where humans are fully in the loop, meaning humans are the ones making decisions, but they're going to get information through conformal prediction. And another where humans are partially in the loop. So a model can make an automated decision, but it can also defer to a human when it's not confident about it. So let's start with fully in the loop. Let's say a doctor is trying to diagnose a patient who's presented with breathing difficulty. So of course they, they order a chest x-ray. Now depending on what hospital they work at, how, how data savvy they are, that uh, x-ray might come back with more or less information. If the hospital doesn't use models at all, the doctor will get the x-ray alone and they'll have to use all their knowledge and experience to consider all the possibilities and eventually come up with some diagnosis. That might be a long task. If the hospital is a bit more data savvy, they might have a model in place that gives them a top one prediction about what the most likely ailment is in its pulmonary. Well, in that case, the doctor really has no sense of how confident the model was. Like, is it absolutely sure that this is right? Or is this just a guess? And uh, maybe nothing's wrong at all. Contrast that with a case where the hospital provides a model that uses conformal prediction which then returns a set of possibilities back to the doctor. And along with that set, we get a confidence guarantee. For example, there's a 95% confidence that the true answer is in the set I've provided. This prediction set will allow the doctor to narrow their focus down to the most relevant or most likely ailment. And hopefully it will speed up their decision making so that we can take action on the patient faster. Especially though, this confidence guarantee is what makes uh, this method stand out. Because the doctor can, uh, can pay attention to the confidence. They know that 5% of the time, the model's actually not going to get it right. And so they can use their judgment and their use, years of experience to try to suss out when they need to go beyond the model and uh, use their own, rely on their own knowledge. But at the end of the day, it's the doctor who uh, makes the final diagnosis, and assigns likelihoods to all the possibilities of that diagnosis. So it, this is an example where I think society has not yet become comfortable with using models to fully automate diagnosis. 
do like the fact that doctors are the ones using their experience and judgment at the end of the day. But certainly in other industries, and there are many examples of where we are comfortable, at least part of the time, with having models make the final decision. So you're in the financial industry, uh, one example would be mortgage underwriting, right? So let's say uh, your bank has implemented a model to do mortgage underwriting that uses formal prediction. When a new application for a mortgage is submitted, it goes to that model, which will return prediction set. Now, if that set comes back and it only contains one element, approved, then that means the model is confident about what it's seen, and we can go ahead and automatically apply that decision, giving uh, an answer back to the customer with a second. Also, if the model comes back and says, the prediction set only contains decline, we can also go ahead and make that. Now, some of the time, the model will give you a prediction set that says both approved and decline, which is a little silly, I guess. Uh, but all it means is that the model is uncertain about what it should do, not confident. And in that case, we can simply defer the decision to a human underwriter, can use their judgment and experience, along with any interesting information that the model could provide. And again, the great thing is that through the conformal guarantee, we can tune our tolerance for error. We can choose an acceptable error rate and have confidence uh, that these predictions are going to be right some percent of the time. So I hope that illustrates nicely some of the ways that conformal prediction could be used to quantify uncertainty. I believe this is crucial for trustworthy AI applications, uh, especially in cases where we're using automated decisioning with high human impact. And that's because uh, when humans discuss with each other and when humans make decisions, always thinking about how confident we are and providing alternatives when we're not. Uh, so let me end there. I think we have plenty of time for questions and I'm more than happy to answer anything that comes. Thank you for your attention. Have a question. Thank you. Hello. Um, my question is um, in statistics, you can compute a confidence interval um, based on your probability distribution. It's a rigor that rigorous approach to get the confidence interval that you want. How different is that from the approach that you showed here? And if there's a difference, what resources can you point us to read about to see if this approach has that guarantee of one minus alpha? Yeah, interesting question about confidence intervals. So uh, confidence intervals are not as simple to use as formal prediction in my opinion. For example, with confidence intervals, you might need to train many models on slightly different versions of data, so-called bootstrap. But that's an extremely expensive thing to do, especially when you're working with large-scale machine learning. If I need to train 100 models rather than one in order to get confidence intervals, that can be a very big barrier. So one of the greatest things about conformal prediction is that it's simple in that you do not need to modify the model at all. You can treat the model as a black box, only use it for inference, and still get confidence, something similar to confidence intervals uh, using a calibration data set. Does that answer the question? What resources should we read on to get to understand that guarantee of using one model and getting a confidence interval? Uh, there's a really nice introduction to conformal prediction and by uh, Anastasios Angelopoulos, and the title is A Gentle Introduction to Conformal Prediction. So if you search A Gentle Introduction, you will find that story. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. So you mentioned that deep neural networks are miscalibrated, and I think it was shown in the 2017 paper, and after that there have been a lot of calibration techniques like temperature scaling, which is a post hoc calibration technique. There have also been calibration techniques that do during training calibration of neural networks. So does it make sense uh, to use this kind of prediction on top of calibrated probabilities or would you want to do it on uncalibrated logics? Yeah, interesting question. 
So I'll first point out that uh, to achieve a calibrated neural network as you stay, you need to apply techniques after the fact. So you need to account for this during training. Take a model out of the box, chances are it will be very poorly calibrated. So I think we agree on that. Um, and yes, I do think it's still useful to use conformal prediction on top of a calibrated model. It gives you, for one thing, prediction sets, which I've argued are useful in their own right. Even if you have a calibrated model, it will still only give you point predictions, which don't offer alternatives in the case of an uncertain answer. So if a model is calibrated but has 20% confidence on its point estimate, I might still want to know what the other likely possibilities are. And so uh, conformal prediction provides a little bit more guarantee over and above what calibration. But excellent question. Thank you. Can I? Uh, Please. Hi, Jesse. Great talk. So uh, I can see two basic sources of the origin of uncertainty. One, as you pointed out, is more statistical, like you have limited data. One is more systematic, like the hyperparameters of your network. So I wonder. Is there any way, at least with this method or some other method, to separate the two sources so I can understand if I need more data or a better architecture? Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. I think you're, you're asking about aleatoric and epistemic certainty, sometimes called. Uh, and conformal prediction does not exactly align with that split thinking. It's doing something a bit different. Um, so I don't think there's a clear answer to your question that's grounded in conformal prediction. Uh, maybe that's a bit unsatisfactory, but it's, it's simply moving in a slightly different direction than the way you're thinking about it. But nevertheless, that's a very useful split to have in mind. That's all right. Thank you. Can I just ask a quick one, too? Um, how, does, how does your method square with like the example you gave at the beginning of something that's actually out of distribution? Could you repeat so, that last so, part? The door was open. Oh, sorry. Quite so, here. for example, you showed at the beginning um, a, a shoe, I think, or something, right? Sure. When it's with, with MNIST. How would, like, would you expect that just it returns the entire set of MNIST as the, the potential set because it's uncertain if it, if it was predicting on a shoe? Or how would, you, how would you handle something actually out of distribution? Yeah, you're getting at something very, which I didn't uh, specify, but one of the requirements of formal prediction is that the new data points we're receiving at inference time come from the same distribution as our calibration data. Okay, so that is another caveat. If, uh, if we do calibration on a calibration data set and then later get data points which are very different from the calibration, well, the calibration is useless. So if our calibration data set had shoes and shirt uh, along with twos and three, then the conformal guarantee would hold and we would have a confidence guarantee. If our data point, if the distribution changes later on and we start getting shoes and shirts when we used to have digits, well, all bets are off, unfortunately. The approach doesn't directly uh, cover that. Thank you. No, thank you, that's a good question. 